good morning, everybody. Well, good morning, everybody. It's nice to know when people are listening. I'm not talking to myself. Although I could be quite content talking to myself. Because sometimes it's the talking to yourself in which you come into the prayers and you enforce things in your heart that God is speaking to you in the quiet time. Don't you love the fact that God is a speaking God? You know, he just doesn't leave us in silence for a muteness so that we don't know what's going on. He speaks to us. And this morning, I'd like to speak to you about the eyes. You know, often there's the phrase, isn't it? The eyes are the window to the soul. I know this personally that, you know, sometimes I cannot hide my emotions or the seat of my emotions or character if somebody is looking in my eyes. If I'm angry, you will see it in my eyes. If I'm sad, you will see it in my eyes. If I'm happy, you will see it in my eyes. If I'm joyful, if I'm loving, all these different things of communication of the soul, which is the seat of your personality, of your emotions, can be seen through your eyes. If your soul is not in a good place, then that can be seen through your eyes. If your soul equally is in a very good place, that can be seen through your eyes. The first thing I like to do when I talk to people is look at their eyes. And if people can't hold the stare or they turn away or they look elsewhere because it's uncomfortable, that usually is a very good indicator that there's something not good going on. But equally so, if you get the intense stare where somebody's not just looking at you, they're almost burning a hole in the back of your skull, you know they're not in a good place too. Communicate something. We like to feel that we can hold our cards close to our chest, but the training that you have to do is your eyes can sometimes give you away as to where you're at. Even if you confess to be in a good place, even if you can put on a smile, your eyes can reveal your very heart and soul to people. But equally, your eyes can also show you where your heart is at or where your soul is by what you focus on or choose to look at or dwell in. There's a famous Christian writer called A.W. Tozer. And I just want to read a bit of his quote to you. This is what he says. Sin... I repeat, in addition to anything else it may be, it's always an act of wrong judgment. So the eyes are part of judgment. We see and we discern with the eyes what needs to be right and what needs to be wrong. And sometimes when we fall into sin, we say something which is wrong is right. And something which is right we say is wrong because in our eyes we see it this way. So it's important to realize that your eyes can choose righteousness and they can also choose sin. To commit a sin, a man must for the moment believe that things are different from what they really are. He must confound values. He must see the moral universe out of focus. He must accept the lie as truth. And see truth as a lie. He must ignore the signs on the highway and drive with his eyes shut. He must act as if he had no soul and was not accountable for his moral choices. So here's the reality. We are all able to sin and we are all able to do good things as well. But the moment we choose the wrong thing... It's as if we're blinded. It's as if we've taken our eyes off what our true hope is. It's like the story of Peter when he's getting out of the boat and he sees Jesus in the distance and he's walking to him and he's able to walk on the water. All of a sudden he takes his eyes off him and focuses on his circumstance on the environment that's around him. Immediately as he focuses on the environment around him, he starts to sink. He starts to become lesser than God had called him to be. He starts to reach into his own strength, his own mind, his own reasoning, and not the will of God, and not the power of the Spirit. 
He focuses on the natural and not the supernatural. And this is what Tozer is getting at. As soon as we start to see things in the wrong light, we take away our hope in Jesus. And we put our hope in things which are not worthy of our hope to be grounded in. Sin is never a thing to be proud of. No act is wise that ignores remote consequences. And sin always does. Sin sees only today or at the utmost tomorrow. Never the day after tomorrow, next month or next year. Death and judgment are pushed aside as if they did not exist and the sinner becomes for the time a practical atheist who by his act denies not only the existence of God but the concept of life after death. You know, we carry on knowing Jesus and who he is and what he's done and live the life as if we were a sinner, then there's no life after death. Because we've taken out the not concept that there is a consequence for what we're doing. It's a beautiful scripture, isn't it? What you reap is what you sow. And if we continue to reap the wrong things, we will reap the wrong reward. But if we continue to reap the right things, we will reap a heavenly reward. That God has got for us. The notion that the careless sinner is a smart fellow and the serious minded Christian, though well intentioned, is a stupid dolt altogether. Out of touch with life, it will not stand up under scrutiny. Sin is basically an act of moral folly, and the greater the folly, the greater the fool. And we think, oh, that's a powerful thing. But, you know, isn't there forgiveness? Isn't there all the different aspects that we take into board? This is what Jesus says in John 9, verse 39 to 41. It says, Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world. For judgment I came into this world. That was the purpose of Christ coming on this world was to judge us. Whether we're right Or whether we're wrong. How does he judge us? By living the light. The life in the right way. He is the example. He is the measuring rod to which we are all compared to. You know, sometimes with our eyes we're so focused looking at one another. Looking at what each other has. Desiring what the other has. And not realizing that the reality is that we should only be desiring what Christ has. And who he is. For he is the ultimate example. He is the one that we are to follow. He is the one by which all our judgments should be made. As we seek to walk on this earth. And follow his path. That those who do not see me may see. And those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. So here is the reality, three things that we understand. That having a hope in who Jesus is and what he does causes us to see something in a new dimension. Our eyes are opened. We are no longer blinded. We are opened to the eyes of hope. And this hope is a window onto our soul. That we have a future. And the future's bright. And it most certainly isn't orange. It's Jesus Christ. The risen Lord. The Son of God. Who though the enemy sought to fit to put him in the grave... Locked him away with a big stone. Death could not hold him. For in him there was no sin. He's right. The wages of sin is death. He cannot die. Because he was righteousness itself. Sin had to be put on him by the Spirit. When he was on the cross. It was not his sin. It was our sin. 
When he says to us that your burdens will be light if you take on my burden, the reality is this, is that he has taken on your burden and the burdens of the world that we may be able to stand before God and see him in the age that is to come. Such power. And yet here are these Pharisees. This story tags on to the story about Jesus healing the man who was blind from birth. And if we know the story of Isaiah 35, it talks about how God will make those who are blind will see. How God will heal those who are deaf. How he will heal the lame. How he will cause the mute to speak. And these are all signs of God's coming salvation. Isaiah 35 verse 1 to 10. And these Pharisees, these leaders know the scriptures. And here is a blind man who has been healed. He was blind from birth. He's never seen before. And we can be like the blind man as Gentiles. Never seeing before. And yet all of a sudden, we get a glimpse of hope. For what Christ has done. And the scales fall off our eyes. Just like Paul on the road to Damascus. And we see him as who he is. The representative of God on earth. Incarnate. God has come. And he's come to make amends for our sin. That we may have peace with God. And a hope for the future. But these Pharisees, they knew the scriptures. They seen with their own eyes what he had done. And yet they profess him to be demon, to be evil. Because they saw their own glory and their own power. If they acknowledged who Jesus was, they would lose what they wanted for themselves. And this is what Jesus is talking about, those who see who will be blinded. Blinded by what? Their own selfish desires. Their own wants. Their own pursuits of power and glory. Their own pride. They will be guilty. It talks a lot for us that we need to be in the right place the right time. If we confess that we know who Jesus is, we need to honor him in our lives. We need to be truthful about who we are and where our failings are and where our strengths are and be satisfied that he can make all things new and he will continue to do such a good work in you that he will transform and renew your mind But the reality is this, is that we need to be able to control our eyes. That we see things in light of Christ and Christ crucified. But not only crucified, resurrected. And not only resurrected, sitting at the right hand of the Father. And not only sitting at the right hand of the Father, he is coming again. And he's going to make all things new. He will put everything underneath his feet. You know what that means? It's a symbol of authority. When the kings were defeated by other kings, what they do, they would, pref- they would make the kings come in their chains before the king that defeated them. They had to bow their knee to him, and they put their feet above their necks. And it was a symbol. I have the ability over your life. I have power over who you are. It's through my actions that you can live or you can die. And if you choose to betray me, I will break your neck. But if you choose to follow me, I will let you live. And you will live under my glorious reign and protection. That's what it's talking about when it says everything will be put under the feet of Jesus. Because he will submit everything onto him. All power and all authority. Matthew 6, 22 to 24. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. 
But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. You know, the number one thing that affects people who lose their sight is depression. You are twice as more as likely to become depressed if you lose your sight than if you have your sight. Why is that? Because most people find hope in what they see. As soon as they stop seeing what they hope in, what they desire, what they long for, all of a sudden their hope goes. But they also say as well that you know you stand a greater chance of conquering depression if you believe in the higher power. There's been studies to prove that people who believe in the higher power are more likely to combat and defeat depression than those who don't believe in God at all. Because it's a hope outside of themselves. It's a hope outside of their circumstances that they're looking to. They're looking to a power that's beyond them. And their belief in that power can set them free from their situation or their circumstance. So if you know people who are down, cause them to hope in the greater God. Who is more than able to transform their situation and take them on to newer paths. So the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in you, is darkness, how great is the darkness? In other words, if you behold the wrong things with your eyes, if you dwell in the wrong context, how great will the darkness be throughout the whole of your body? bestows upon us an importance to make sure that we watch things which are good and not evil. It's important that we are not watching things which determine evil things, whether it be sexual, whether it be horror, whether it be the occult, whether it be all the things about lust, jealousy. All these things can take a hold of your body if you allow your eyes to focus on it. Elsewhere in Matthew 5.29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Pretty drastic. You know, if you're in that situation in your circumstance, most of us don't think about gouging our eyes out. There are Christians in China who've done the very thing that I'm saying temptation's been too much for them and they've blinded themselves because they've taken the scripture literally. This is what they're to do. But what Jesus is saying through this scripture is that you are to make sure that you do not carry on down the same path. You are to blind yourself to the opportunity of doing the wrong thing. And you are to open your eyes up to the hope of doing the right thing by following him and prioritizing that which is good over that which is evil. You know, we know so much that you need light to see. That's what it means when we're talking about being in a good environment, in a healthy environment. Make sure you can see properly. Don't spend time in darkness. As soon as darkness comes, you need to be heading for the light. I love the story of Joseph. There he is in Potiphar's household. And here is Potiphar's wife. And she must have been a really beautiful woman. And she's coming into the room. And what does Joseph do? He doesn't stay there. He flees. Not because he's a coward. But because he respects his master. He respects himself. And he respects God. And he honors him with his body, with his sight, with everything he has. He flees through the door to follow God's destiny for him. Even in the moment of that fleeing, when he's wrongly judged and he's thrown into prison, he still has a hope. He still has a focus, not on his current circumstance, but on who God is going to do what God has said for him in the past. He knew the dreams that God gave him, 
that God will put in him in a position of authority, that his brothers will be bowed before him, and that he will provide. So that when at the end of Genesis, and he's talking to the brothers, he said, what you intended for evil, God has brought about for good. The greatest evil that Satan has ever done was the cross. And yet God used it as the greatest power and the salvation that mankind has ever known. No other sacrifice is worthy of that sacrifice. That he would lie down on the cross willingly, forsaking his godhood, forsaking his human rights, and taking responsibility for those who had no rights, that they may be restored, sanctified, and made whole. It's not about our rights, it's about our responsibilities to who God is and what the will of God would have us do. We can complain about our situation and what we're experiencing and what we see, but we need to be focused on what we don't see and what God is doing to us on the inside. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Don't you love the words of Jesus as he's sitting in the garden of Gethsemane? He's turned his back on all the earthly life that has to offer. He could have had the gold, could have had the riches. He could have been the king of Israel. He could have been king of the world. Satan offered him all these things. He could have had the power All the things that you could possibly want, the nice houses, the flash transport, the right women, all these things that people desire in this world. And there he is in the Garden of Gethsemane at his lowest moment, praying that he didn't have to take on the responsibility of the cross. But then he says the most powerful words that man has ever said. Nevertheless, Not my will, but your will be done. The Father's will, not our will, not our desire that we see with our eyes. Christ is calling us to be like him, to follow after him, to say at the end of the day, Lord, it doesn't matter what I experience in this moment, in this time, in this place. Nevertheless, Let your will be done and not mine. It's a place of humility. It's a place of purpose. And really, it's the only way. He is the truth, the light, and the way. None can come to the Father except through him. Romans 8, 22 to 25. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. You know, There's something that we need to realize. There's something that we need to hope for. There's something that we need to have in us. A dissatisfaction for the here and now. And a longing for that which is to come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Your servants are waiting 
It doesn't matter when you come, Lord. We want you to come as soon as possible. I don't need to be married first before you come, Lord. I don't need to have seven children before you come, Lord. I don't need the job promotion before you come, Lord. I don't need to bury those who are close to me before you come, Lord. Just come and come now. That's what my heart is longing for, that I would surrender everything that I have, that I'm ready to come. And when he turns up, being like those virgins, those who have the oil burning, ready to follow the bridegroom into the wedding, ready to take part in the kingdom that is yet to come and is also here in the here and now. The first fruits of the Spirit, groaning inwardly. We are not called to be a people of the flesh. We are called to be a people of the Spirit. How many times do we exercise the gifts? How many times do we exercise the fruit? How many times are we looking for these things over the fruit of the world and the gifts that the world has to offer? Do you pray in tongues? Do you prophesy? Do you encourage? Do you speak words of hope into one another? Do you take time to pray for one another? Do you love? Are you kind? Are you patient? Are you gentle? Are you long-suffering? Are you temperate? All these things have eternal value. The peace, the truth, the love, the faith. These are the things that we are groaning inwardly, waiting as we give birth. Like a pregnant woman, ready, eagerly waiting for the second coming. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for that which we do not see, we wait for it with a patience. And in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have already been fully known. God knows us fully. We know him partially. We had an experience of his spirit. We have an experience of seeing what is in his word. We have an experience of seeing what he does in our everyday lives, whether he is our provider, whether he is our healer, whether he is the one who is with us, the come alongside, the comforter. All these things are a partial revelation of who he is. Yet there will come a day when we will see him fully. And our eyes will be opened to who he is, transfixed, falling down on our faces in the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Unapologetically so. Our focus will be on him and him alone. In the here and now, we can be forgiven from drifting and looking elsewhere. But in the here and after, we will never look anywhere else. For once you've got him in your gaze, there's nothing that can distract you. You know, some people take solace. They say, they turn around and say, you know, when I'm married to my partner and I die, I will no longer be married to her. And I ask that question, but I want to be married to her. And I think, well, actually, in reality, when you come into the presence of the Lord, that will seem insignificant. It will seem lesser. The intimacy that you have with a man and a woman will be lesser than the intimacy that you can have with God. The power, the revelation, to be fully known, to fully know him. His infiniteness just blows my earthly mind. So therefore, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 18, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. 
Our inner self is being renewed day by day. See the priority? It's not what you see on the outside. It's not how you look. It's not whether you've got the right lipstick on. It's not whether you've got the right clothes. It's not whether you've got the right perfume. It's not whether you're doing steroids to make yourself look pumped. It's none of these things. These things will diminish if your value, your treasure, your worth is in how you look and what you see around you, then you've lost all hope. But if your value is in the improving on the inside, your character, your soul, making sure that you're good, allowing the Spirit to purify you, listening to His voice, Following his guidance, allowing him to write the word of God in your heart, in your soul, and in your mind. And by all strength, walking in his presence. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, light momentary affliction. There are some people who suffer quite a lot in this life. But in proportion to the next life that is coming, it's a light momently affliction. No, for all those who truly have been martyred in the faith, it's a light momentary affliction. No, it kind of puts a sort of like full stop on our own suffering and our own trials. Because in reality, they can't compare to what we're about to come into. What we're about to embrace. It's a light, momently affliction. You have to think that what you suffer and what you experience in this life in pain and all the different things that make you anxious and make you worried, they are a light, momentary affliction. Insignificant. Insignificant to what you're about to come into, to who you're about to spend the rest of your eternal life with, the glory that you're about to behold. This light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You can imagine the best thing for some people, it's ice cream. For some people, it's a new handbag. For other people, it's a new car. For other people, it's a job promotion. You know what? You can imagine the best thing that can make you feel happy, that you want instant gratification from, because that's what sin is. The best thing that you desire with your eyes is a light, momently affliction. There's no feeling that can compare to when you come into the weight of glory. You know? Some of the times you see with, with people who do drugs, one of the things that they, they get into their minds or into their reality is that there is no greater feeling, there is no greater pleasure than they experience when they're doing the drug. And the reason then why they continue to do it is because when they come off the drug and they're into their own mundane, boring lives, they lose their hope. And so they take more and more and more and more. And as they take more and more, what happens to the body is it starts to resist. And the pleasure that they get is not as great as it was the first time. But they carry on chasing and chasing the dream, the desire to feel like they felt the first time. But the reality is that they will never feel it. And the reality is the more and more they become addicted to the drug that they're taking, that their life is slowly ebbing away from them. To the point that most people who drink, take drugs will end up taking their own lives. And have no fear from doing it because they want to take their life on the high. They don't want to be in the low. And it's the same for those who play computer games. The stimulus that comes in their minds as they're playing the game, they're getting excited. Oh, I've got a new level. Oh, I've powered up. Oh, I've got the gold. I've got everything ready. I'm about to take level 55. The excitement, the compassion. 
The same with those who watch football. Oh, my team, they're coming into the first half. Oh, they're going to take it. They're going to score. We're going to have promotion. And then they get promoted and then it's back to square one. And they go through the angst, suffering, and, the, and the, oh, no, they're going to score. A light, momently affliction. Is it really worth all your finances for a season ticket? Is it really worth to invest in the high? Or are the greater things to invest in called the kingdom of God, which has no boundaries and which will keep you in the right place? Joy, not based on your circumstance or your situation. You can either choose to embrace joy or you can either choose to embrace happiness. I want my children to be good, not happy. I want my children to know God, not have the best education. I want my children to know Jesus, not have the best job. I want to prioritize the things of the kingdom in my family over the things of this world. For what's good is it sending your kids to university if they're only corrupted into a worldly system and they start to disbelieve the things of this earth? There's lots of things that people teach you in education which are not essential. It's philosophies of men which have been guided by the father of lies. Do not lose heart in this moment of true affliction. He's preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The man who had the greatest afflictions that had ever been known, except for Jesus, who experienced the greatest pain and suffering, was a man called Job. And it's a book about how one can experience loss, pain, hurt, suffering. All the things that you see in this world were taken away from him. His health, his livelihood, his family. His relationships, all these things were taken from him. And yet this is what he says about his true hope. This is why Job was a righteous man. For I know, this is chapter 19, verse 25, 29. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me, if you say how we will pursue him, and the root of the matter is found in him. Be afraid of the sword, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. Our bodies are dying. Our bodies are fading away. But there will come a day when we will have a new body. And we will see him stood on the earth with his sword ready to take charge, ready to divide those who are his and those who are not his. And all you need to do is to have a vision for him and him alone in this life. Don't settle for second best. Only Jesus is the best. He is worthy of all glory, all honor, and all power, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Alan.